Khan is a bit of an environmental hazard today because <laughs> she's got a very bad cold and took lots of drugs to try and deal with it and uh, the results could be a little unpredictable. <laughs> uh, so if my words come out in strange orders, just use your imagination. But before we um, formally um, commence proceedings and I introduce our extraordinary panel, I'd just like to um, say that this session uh, is being uh, uh, devoted to uh, PEN, the um, Writers' Organisation, which stands for Poets, Essayists and Novelists, which was founded in 1921 to act as a powerful voice on behalf of writers harassed, imprisoned and sometimes killed for their views. We have an em the empty chair on stage, which you often see at writers' festivals, is a symbol adopted by Penn International to represent the writers who cannot be with us because they are imprisoned for their writing. Uh, we have here somewhere? Yep. Where? Over there, sorry, over there. Next to, uh, next to Peter, there's the chair, uh, the empty chair, and the, on that is a photograph of the two Thai student playwrights, Patty Watt and Port Sniff, who are both in jail because of a play that they wrote. They were found to have contravened Thailand's Les Majeste law. They were the charge of Les Majeste, if I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, and that's not even to do with the drugs, um, criminalises alleged insults to the monarchy under the Thai criminal code and is commonly used to silence peaceful dissent. You can visit the Penn website to learn more about uh, the issues, these particular people, and the very important work that Penn does. Um, we're now going to move on to our session, which is called Environ Environmental Rights Are Human Rights. And you'll notice there's no exclamation point or question mark at the end of that statement. And so uh, I'm uh, interpreting that to be a proposition that we're going to examine, um, explore, and perhaps take a little bit further in this session. We have a wonderful panel. We have a senator, a scientist, and a lawyer. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Um, but these are all <laughs> extraordinary men who have all changed the world one way or another in their own lifetimes through in incredible work that they've done. And so get, we're going to be drawing on their wisdom, their expertise and their eloquence today to address this question. On my immediate left, we have uh, Bob Brown, who, of course, is the former senator, former leader of the Australian Greens. Thank you. Thank you. And, appa and apparently fairly popular with you lot. Um, I say, uh, next along is David Mann, who is the Executive Director <laughs> of Refugee Legal. Well known for his appearances before the High Court. <laughs> and then uh, on my extreme left, and I'm not sure if I'm speaking politically or, or um, geographically, <laughs> is Dr Peter Doherty, who of course is a scientist who's... I didn't even have to mention the Nobel Prize, gosh. <laughs> okay, so just to get straight into, oh, I forgot to mention that uh, Bob's book is called Optimism and Peter's book is called The Knowledge Wars and David's book, which he is writing, he hasn't named yet, uh, but he'll be here uh, one year in the future to talk about it and you'll be able to buy copies then. I know the feeling well. Um, so let's get straight to the question, environmental rights are human rights and I'm going to ask David to start and could you just briefly say to us, first of all, is this a proposition, is this a question? Um, explain what you mean by that, by what, what you think this, this sentence means. Well, well uh, at, at the most fundamental level, uh, the environment and its protection is a prerequisite for the enjoyment of human rights. Um, and as part of that, I would say that that takes us to uh, a fundamental obligation that states and the international community have to ensure that the environment is protected so that we can enjoy those human rights which uh, states are duty bound to afford us. And um, the second issue that I think is really critical here is that um, the proper decision making, just decision making on environmental protection uh, requires certain human rights to be afforded. That includes making sure that there is proper participation of those affected. Uh, it also means that there is proper information used to make assessments about matters that uh, could have profound environmental uh, effects or consequences. And uh, the third is access to justice, uh, the most fundamental concept of access to justice. The third thing that I'd say, and the third and final thing, is that there is a, 
I think, a, a fascinating uh, uh, issue at stake here, and that is, should there be, or is there indeed, a, a right to a decent environment, which is a very controversial matter uh, in this area? And you're saying that these rights do not currently exist? Well, I think that there is a real controversy over whether there exists the right to a decent environment. Well, it hasn't itself. been codified, let me put it that way. It certainly hasn't been yeah. codified, but what we do have is a vast uh, array of uh, fundamental human rights, such as uh, economic and social rights or cultural rights, the right to food, to housing. Uh, there's also civil and political rights. The right to life uh, is central to this. And uh, those rights are well recognised. States owe those rights to us. They also have obligations to people in other countries. And uh, if the environment is not protected, but rather destroyed, as we're seeing, uh, those rights simply cannot be enjoyed. OK. Peter, um, how do you interpret this sentence? I think, the, uh, as David said, the, the question of environmental rights, as a, as a general question, has come up relatively recently, in, in a sense. And, and why is that? Well, as a, a biomedical scientist, I, I, and all scientists, we think in terms of numbers and measurements. And what's happened over the last century or more is we've had a massive increase in the human population. We've had at least a fourfold increase in the human population since 1900. And even in my lifetime, I'd say uh, I was born in 1940, which makes me pretty geriatric, but uh, the human population has increased at least two and a half, maybe three times. This, of course, puts enormous pressure on the environment. And suddenly we realise that the environment that we grew up with, at least from my childhood, is rapidly disappearing and rapidly being degraded. Unfortunately, the question of environmental rights and human rights also cuts across some, at times, across some other human rights. And that's where we get into all sorts of conflict. I mean, rights that have been codified in law, like, like the right of a landowner to do what they want with their property and so forth. So we get into complex issues from the legal point of view, from the philosophical moral point of view, that, of course, is another perspective. I expect Bob probably has thought about more, that more than anyone. Well, Bob, this is your turn. What, how do you interpret this, this statement, this proposition? Uh, well, the earth has no rights. Um, but all of us as individuals have a, gr a great pile of them and they're codified into law. And until we uh, get past this modern phenomenon that we are separate from the earth, we're above it, we're in man we've taken over control, and we know it is right for us because what's right for us has to be right for it. We're headed to obvious trouble and we all know we're going into a ex extraordinary morass of environmental breakdown, but uh, the mantra of the day is growth. Uh, and everything's subservient to the great god growth, which means extracting more of the living biosphere for our own consumption. We, as Peter was just saying, single herd of mammals, now at 7.4 billion. Uh, I came onto the planet just after Peter, but yes, there was two and a half billion back then. There's 7.4 billion, we're headed for 10 to 12 billion this century, and we're already using 150% of the renewable living resources of the planet. That is, it's going backwards. Uh, and the rest of the world wants to catch up, that is the, when I use that term, the, the world, because I'm conditioned to shutting out the rest of the biosphere when I do it, like we all are, when the rest of the people in the world um, see what we've got, they want it. And we're in this impossible situation of a finite living planet which cannot stand it. So we need a, a global treaty on, uh, amongst ourselves on how we lay off. And that means how we ascribe rights to the biosphere without which we cannot exist. It can do quite nicely without us but not the reverse. And the only thing uh, that's standing in the way of that is using our intelligence, the facts that are in front of us. But we've just had a, an election in this country where 90% of Australians voted for the biggest coal mine on earth, Adani, um, the Adani coal mine to the north. It's been given the go-ahead by environment ministers from state, at state and federal, federal level. Uh, most Australians voted for that. That the hole in the ground there will be so big that if you stand on one edge when it's finished, you won't be able to see the other side. It's beyond the horizon, and it'll be producing of itself 4% of the greenhouse gases warming up and destroying 
the living ecosystem of this planet by the mid-50s. But Hoover, I've never seen a federal election where environment and environmental rights was less on the agenda since before the Whitlam government. Mm. So, and where the wealthiest, best off people ever in terms of material wealth being on the face of the planet. So we can discuss rights and I'm one of those who believes that our fellow creatures have a right to exist on this planet and it's very difficult for us to argue that ours is bigger or better than theirs. But um, as we've just heard, it's not codified, it's not about to be codified and anybody who talks about it is going to be seen as a green extremist radical wacko. Uh, certainly in the Murdoch media, which is not into environmental rights. So that, that's the situation we're in, and the question is, how do we ascribe the right of this planet to go on keeping life, which so far as we know in the planet only exists on this one, we can postulate there are plenty of others, but we don't know yet, and on top of that life, the awareness, the, the uh, intellect that we have that's evolved on this planet to be able to then interfere with the very thing that kept us going, which was a stable biosphere. We're making it unstable. We're destroying our own rights by not ascribing the right of this planet to have a stable persistence with its, with its fantastic myriad, uh, rich, interwoven, fragile ecosystem. And until we do recognize, stop and recognise that and, and get back on track with that, we're depriving ourselves, certainly our grandkids, of their right to happiness on this planet. I should... Um, <laughs> I neglected to mention at the beginning when I introduced our panel that there will be time for audience questions, about 10 minutes at the end, so just bear that in mind. And of course we want short, sharp questions, not, um, not statements and no rants, please. Um, um, there seems to be quite a diametrical difference between what David's saying and what Bob is saying. And one is, you know, that we all agree that we should have these rights, but on the, on the other hand, do we have time? Is what I interpret Bob saying. There is an urgency to this situation. Um, Peter, in your book, you say that we have a duty of care to the planet. And I think that basically summarises up what, what Bob was saying. But how do we exercise that duty of care? And what, what degree of urgency do we need to apply to it? Peter. Duty of care? Um, well, duty of care, of course, is a concept in medicine. We have a duty of care. If you turn up in an emergency room, there's a duty of care. The doctor has to look after you. I think we have a duty of care for the planet. I think we have a duty of care for all life on the planet. I agree completely with Bob. Mm. And as we lose species, we also degrade ourselves. There are all sorts of ways. We, aren't, we are part of ecosystems. For instance, our, our food ecosystem depends on the birds and the bees. We, we have to have pollination. Our, our marine ecosystem depends on the plankton and the species uh, that grow on the barrier reef that are adversely affected by warming oceans that destroy the corals. And that's the harvest of the ocean, which is the fish we eat. So, so basically, duty of care has to extend across the ecosystem itself. As, as a medical scientist, I, I get involved in the whole climate change debate. And I'm, I don't claim to be an expert, and I'm certainly not an expert on the causes of climate change, because I'm not a physicist, and I have to trust what these people are telling me. And so I talk to them, I listen to them, I decide they're straight up and they're decent people, and basically I trust them. But I am in the medical sciences. I train initially as a vet, so I've got interest beyond just human, human existence. And in the medical sciences, we have to accept that all life is interlinked and that we're all part of the system, whether it be through things like uh, the incidence of pandemic infectious diseases or whatever. As we clear the forests in Africa, we expose ourselves to more pandemic viruses. As, as uh, we, we relocate species, we expose ourselves to all sorts of infections. So the whole thing is linked up. We have to have two things, I think, at the point of... Well, three things at the, uh, the forefront of our mind. One is duty of care. The other is sustainability. And the other is intergenerational equity. We're draining the resources of the war world really rapidly. Right. And what's going to be the future for our <coughs> children and our grandchildren? If you talk about the Adani coal mine, you talk about intergenerational equity. First thing is that if you include the product of Adani and other coal mines, and our exports, we are the fifth biggest carbon polluters on the planet, right? 
with 20 million people, 0.03%, I think it is, of the world's population, we are the fifth biggest carbon pollutions on the planet. Uh, the coal producers say, well, equity demands that we let the developing world build, burn coal because it's cheap. Well, apart from the argument that the fact that they're going to be screwed first when climate change really hits, and they are already being screwed, if that were true, that would mean we owe it to them to stop burning coal immediately, right? We don't do that. So it's just crap, the whole argument. So <laughs> we, run, we run our national budget based on growth, OK? Everything's growth. We're like a business that runs a business with only a profit side to the ledger and no debit side mm. to the ledger. Mm. That's what we're doing. That's what our productivity commission's about. Uh, productivity, the commodification of everything, the value of nothing. So, David, um, just picking up from that, I mean, we, I, I guess one, one of the things I'm trying to draw out here is, you know, is there a scientific solution? You know, is there a legal solution? Is there a political solution? Or do we need to, to involve all three ways of thinking and ways of acting if we're going to save, in terms of exercising our duty of care to the planet and all who live on her? Um, David, just speaking from a legal point of view, you know, what, what are the strategies and, and, and can they move fast enough to do what needs to be done? Well, I'd start by saying that the law is really a creature of... Uh, it's a, socio, a social and political creature at the end of the day and, uh, and also ought to be one that reflects our values and intergenerational uh, morality uh, and the like. And I, I mean, I, I, I don't think that the law um, has all the answers, of course, it doesn't. Mm. Uh, the law really, in, in, in some respects, uh, can be very useful as a, a framework. It can, you know, the rule of law, bringing the rule of law into this context can be critical in terms of a global, uh, global compact, which is, I think, what we need and what we don't have. Um, but I think that uh, one of the things which I'd urge uh, serious caution on is a treaty, for example, dealing with uh, what's likely to be mass forced displacement uh, from uh, environmental degradation because um, I think at the moment um, uh, the evidence is sort of in about uh, the creation of uh, treaties to uh, protect people who have to flee. And the fact is that if you look at the current um, state of the world in terms of the global humanitarian crisis, I think what we see is a system not only under strain that is actually, but a system that is broken actually in terms of finding real solutions for people who've been forced to flee from persecution. So I'm, I'm very dubious about just coming up with another treaty, particularly mm. because um, not only do I think that the law cannot provide all the answers, but I also think that it could well be one huge distraction trying to get countries around the world to come up with a treaty to deal with that issue. What I'd like to see, certainly, is the development of far stronger uh, a development of uh, human rights protections uh, in the environmental context. And one that I think is very interesting is the development of uh, a, the right to a decent environment itself. And why I find that particularly compelling is, if it was to be developed, is that it could take us away from what's a very individualised focus on the, the individual's human rights and bring it into the sphere of uh, the common good and the global good. Where is that discussion taking place? Well, the discussion yeah. continues to uh, take place uh, in the UN, for example. That's one er arena in which it's Not renowned place. for its speed of action. No. Um, it's been mm. killed off numerous times, mm. but it continues to arise. Mm. And I think that there are very compelling reasons for uh, bringing it into the discussion, because while I don't think it provides all the solutions, what it could do uh, is, is at, at least in the human rights sphere, in the human rights law sphere, uh, make it clear that th these are not issues about individuals in a particular place, but they affect us all. Absolutely. I mean, I guess the question then becomes, you know, the law by itself can't do it all. Science can point to some of the problems and some of the solutions, but can't deliver the answers. So we're back with politics, is, uh, is, is where the change is going to happen. Um, I don't know if you agree with that, Bob, but I'll, I'll put that to you as a proposition. I do. Um, and when you look at the state of our politics, uh, just look at the state of the politics in our own country for the moment. Let's not think about some of the um, potential catastrophes that are happening in other countries, but just look at our own country and the fact that we have not, you know, we no longer have majority government in, at federal level in this country and possibly won't ever again. And so we have to get used to working in a different way. Um, 
reading Bob's book, uh, I just want to quickly recount a couple of examples he gives that, that he will then take up, I hope, and, and, and draw some lessons from. But given that we now have minority governments and we have um, coalitions required and we need leaders who can work together across different uh, fields of view, different points of view, and in his book, Bob describes three separate uh, meetings that he had with polit political leaders who, saw, who wanted to work with him when he was the leader of the Greens in the Senate. One was with John Howard. He describes with John Howard, you sit side by side, there's no table, you have a cup of tea, you have a cordial talk. Mm. Second one is with Julia Gillard, who's just been elected Prime Minister but doesn't actually have the numbers in the House. I think she's on the phone to you within about 30 seconds and um, saying, Bob, when can we meet? And she flies down to Melbourne, so you come up from Hobart, so she meets you halfway, and I don't know what you had to drink, but whatever it was, obviously successful. Tea. Tea? OK. <laughs> and then there was the meeting with Tony Abbott, I think, took about a, a week to ring you, and by the time you met with him, um, it was in Canberra, in his office, on his terms, and he was there sitting at a table with his feet on the table, and you had to look at the soles of his feet. Yes. Uh, OK. Uh, um, now, he's no longer the Prime Minister, but <laughs> now I think that's, that's the next session. That's the next session. But what I'm saying, this is, these are just three examples of political leaders in our country and the way they've approached negotiating with a significant partner to do with environmental issues. So, Bob, what do you draw from these experiences about our ability to actually do the things that need to be done? Well, John Howard, of course, said that he was greenish. I, I don't greenish. know. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to the Great Australia Bight to get on the Sea Shepherd ship, Steve Irwin, next week to um, look at all the whales out there and oppose BP's onrush of a, of a huge oil rig. And I guess I'll be a little greenish while I'm out <laughs> there too. <laughs> um, Tony Abbott, the experience there speaks for itself. And of course, he said that climate change is crap. Um, Julia Gillard was uh, recognised straight off, even though she'd made a commitment in the opposite direction, that government depended upon there being a, uh, a coming together with the Greens in 2010, and that meant dealing with climate change. And out of that, uh, she was true to her commitment to uh, me and to the Greens. Uh, she's, obviously, there were some things couldn't go on the agenda, but there were others. <coughs> and she carried that through, and Australia became a global leader within 12 months in uh, tackling climate change. Uh, Tony Abbott uh, came the next election, Australians voted again, um, and uh, there was the political ructions that occurred. But out it, out it, he tried to dismantle it, but uh, at least there's the $10 billion renewable energy fund and a few other good things there remaining out of that. But this is really, and uh, we're talking about politicians here, I know how to do that. Um, a democracy is about the people. This is a representative democracy and the representatives they put into the parliament. And while ever they put in coal miners and people who don't care about the environment, uh, then we'll get more of the same. And we are responsible for what we do at the ballot box. And I repeat that 90% of people just voted for more coal mines uh, and coal ports inside the Great Barrier Reef, as well as more logging, uh, destruction of... And we have by the way, got an Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act came in in 1999, which says the minister's duty is to protect rare and endangered species and to bring in management plans which will enhance their ability to survive on the planet and gain them, get themselves back from the threshold of extinction. Now that is treated with utter contempt. And let me go one step further. While we don't, if we did have uh, environmentally strong laws, you need with them a court system that comes, follows that, and then you need a policing system that's going to have them brought into place. Let's look at that. In 2008, the federal court ruled that whaling in Australian waters south of this country was illegal, and has since issued an injunction against the Japanese whaling fleet. In 2014, the International Court of Justice ruled that the Japanese whaling was illegal globally. So what happened? Well, the Japanese whaling fleet came back last uh, summer mm. and harpooned 300 minke whales, 200 of which were pregnant, and sent them as meat back to Tokyo. And our government did nothing. And there was no uh, pandemonium in the streets, nothing. 
Uh, in other words, you can cr uh, create criminality, global criminality, and get away with it. So I said to the kids here the other day, if you broke an injunction of the federal court, you'd go to jail. But if you're the Japanese whaling fleet and there's money and profit and there's growth phenomenon and materialism is involved, well, go to it. And, um, and, and it's left uh, Sea Shepherd, backed by good-hearted people because it's non-tax deductible. They won't allow tax deductibility for Sea Shepherd because they don't want to upset Tokyo. Put their money in and Sea Shepherd's got this little ship coming out um, this summer to chase that whaling uh, fleet when it comes back down. But until we get into the streets, or we're outside the Japanese embassy, or we're not voting for people who keep doing this in the Labor and Liberal parties, we're going to have a set of laws which applies to human rights, which doesn't imply, apply to the rights we have to legislate for the environment, for our fellow creatures, and expect they will be respected by follow through. None of that. So, so this is a, um, a pretty um, pessimistic scenario. No, that's realistic. I'll get on well, to the optimistic all bit. All right, next. okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't want, don't want, to, don't want to create a sideshow here, but I mean, your point about the um, results of the recent federal election and the, the way in which you say 90% of the people voted for coal, I mean, we also now have the... Um, spectacle of a senator uh, from Queensland by the name of Malcolm Roberts who, you know, a week ago could have been shouting on a street corner and people would have laughed at him, is now an Australian senator, was on Lifeline last night on Insiders Today and is now, you know, the latest political novelty for the press gallery and he, he believes that climate change is, you know, created of a cabal of Jewish international bankers. I mean, he is like so far to the right that even Andrew Bolt says he's in that case. So... <laughs> I mean, my point is that he's going to absorb so much media space over the next, you know, this parliament, and the sort of discussion that we should be having, that Bob's talking about, is just not going to happen. So I'm just going to ask, leave, leave Bob for a second and just ask you, Peter, uh, oh. what, what you think we, should, we as citizens can do to address this kind of situation where our voices are being distorted. I, I've had a bit of interaction with Malcolm Roberts via email. And, okay. Uh, Tell, shall, give us, give us shall we say I found it intellectually and, and socially unsatisfactory? But, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think we should let Malcolm out there as much as possible because people will see what he is. I mean, he's, he's, not, uh, he's not on this planet, basically. We know that, but the thing is he's occupying a lot of time and space that could be used to be talking about, you know, how we actually deal with pro real problems. Well, he might take George Brandis or Simon Birmingham or someone off for a while. That'd be good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think we can stop the expression of these, these opinions. I think it's just we have to. As Bob says, it's really up to us. We, we can't expect good things of politicians unless we elect the right politicians, unless we let them know what we think and that we let them know we're going to vote in that way. And, uh, I mean, you can, you can involve all sorts of other things. You can say the state of the media at the moment is a disaster and all the rest of it. But there's a transition going on. I mean, we're transitioning from a print world to an electronic world in the media. Younger people aren't using print media. They're using electronic means of communication. There's some very good things that are electronic. And, uh, and the Murdoch news empire doesn't control what happens in the electronic world, which is great. I think as we think about this issue of environmental uh, equity, human equity with respect to the environment, we can't think in terms of just going back to some imagined past. I, I mean, science has destroyed that past for you. I mean, we are responsible as scientists uh, for the disaster that's happening. And we're responsible because we, we cured these damned infectious diseases that killed everybody. <laughs> if the plague still raged and regularly killed half of the population, we would not have a problem. If we let ISIS take control and take us back to the world what they want, we won't have a problem. There'd be a lot less people on the planet. And, you know, sometimes I think the right, the, the political right, the nutty right, I mean, not the rational right, there is... So, not all conservatives are stupid. It's just that many of them you meet are stupid. So, uh, but basically, if you... If the political right that sort of condemns the science of climate change at, at the same time expects science to solve the problems with climate change. Mm. That's their mm. expectation. Mm. It's ridiculous. 
the political right kind of at the back of their mind, they're thinking, well, if human populations get too big, a pandemic's going to come along and wipe a lot of us out, so we don't have to worry about it. I tell you, it's not going to happen. We're really good at this stuff. <laughs> we're going to stop the pandemic wiping you all out. Uh, we're we're going to be round. We have to deal with this rationally and intellectually, and we have to deal with it in terms of realistic policies. We can't, for instance, say we've got to stop all development. What we've got to, to do well, maybe we even have to commodify everything. Maybe we have to commodify the environments. So it's a commodity with a value. Maybe we, ha we certainly have to commodify putting carbon into the atmosphere, which is what Bob uh, achieved through the carbon tax. And I think that's why uh, Tony Abbott will go down as one of the great criminals of history for repealing the carbon tax. Mm. <laughs> David, um, from your experience of sort of mobilising people to, to good causes and using yep. the courts and using other methods to do it. I mean, how do you see we, we apply, what sort of methods do you see us applying to this issue about trying to get people more mobilised and motivated in the right direction to, both, first of all, create good and, and second, stop the harm? I mean, the undoing of good is, is, is one of the fronts we're battling on as well, as, well as trying to create sure. new solutions. Well, I think the first thing in a democracy, as Bob said, we live in a democracy and we have a fundamental duty to one another to understand the evidence and to make the case. And, uh, and every one of us, not just so-called experts, not politicians, but every single one of us to be informing, uh, informing ourselves well of the evidence, and it's there, um, of informing others that we know of that evidence and doing something about it. And that can involve... And, by the way, I think critically, too, making sure that, uh, that, that the children uh, and, 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 their, and children's children are made aware of the facts and, uh, and what is actually happening to our planet. I, I, I know it's a simple point, but I think that there's not enough of it. I think moral agency here is critical, uh, and we all have a role to play in that. I think that there are plenty of actions that community groups can take to let politicians know what they think. Uh, there are plenty of uh, projects about environmental sustainability that communities can get involved in and to get schools involved in and, and universities, etc. But I also think, um, as part of that, uh, that we need to be out on the streets when there are protests. So I think it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm alarmed by the fact uh, that in this country there still seems to be a, a, a real lack, I think, of getting out in the streets en masse and telling politicians what we think and then taking action about it. So and you think that works? Well, I think on if if it's didn't big work enough, with the Iraq well, war. I think if it, I don't think it's one. I, I don't think it's one. It, it's only one strategy here, but it's part of a, mm. a bigger strategy of of us as a community uh, 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 having a voice, having a critical voice, and asking for change. And I also think as part of it is developing within our community what I would see as a a paradigm shift in in the way in which we think about the planet in the way that Bob has suggested, and also the way that we think about ourselves as fellow human beings, because I think that nothing short of a, a massive moral shift is required, both in our country and globally, so that we do think intergenerationally. What, what planet are we leaving for, our, for the next generation here? So I think that there are plenty of things we can do, and the final point that I'd make on it is, from my experience, is that uh, legal cases can be very important in putting uh, constraints on... on, on, on you know, powerful influences that are polluters. Um, it can be critical. It's one of many different uh, strategies, and I think it's critical that those who have the ability to get involved do. But I think it's a multi-dimensional approach that we need to take, and it's in the power of all of us to do it. And I think that that's the critical thing, uh, that we all, all think about what each of us can do to be part of change here. Mm. I mean, I may be uh, wrong about this, Bob, but that, what it seems to me is that the um, understanding and acceptance of, of, of climate change and, and, its, and its dangers is now pretty widespread. I mean, I saw a figure from the Brookings Institution this morning saying that 80% of Americans now accept uh, that there is um, global warming. Um, the fossil fuel anti the fossil fuel divestment movement has you know, taken on with amazing rapidity, I would have thought, and it's been incredibly successful. Um, the approval of the Adani coal mine in, in the fa face of that, in the face of declining world prices, does seem to be you know, a rather a bizarre exercise, and there's a lot of people who say that it will never go ahead, despite this political dance that's been going on. 
Uh, so I'm just wondering, in the face of the, of the, sort of not the growing number of people who do accept that, that, that we have a really urgent problem here, why is it that our politicians are so recalcitrant? Oh, that's a good question. So it, acting yeah. in the face of yeah. <laughs> reality. Yeah. Mm. It all comes down to money and the power and mm. influence of the mega rich corporations, which have global government, um, and it's a de facto global government, uh, but they do govern the resource use of the planet and distribution and, and the rules by which uh, that all works or doesn't work. And uh, a poignant, well, you know, yesterday Paul and I were driving just the other side of Lismore here, having an afternoon drive around the locality, and there's a little village, well, it's not a village, there's just a hall out in some paddocks at a place called Bentley. And uh, you might know <laughs> that uh, up to 10,000 people protested out, protested out there uh, against the onrush of uh, empowered, politically empowered gas extraction companies and have stopped it. But there, here was the town hall with people getting up the steps and cars all over the place, just out in the middle. I thought, oh, uh, uh, here's another insurrection. They, of course, when you win an environmental battle, you have to prepare to fight again. When you lose it, you lose it forever. Mm. But here's what's coming. Uh, earlier this year in Tasmania, there's 49 hectares of a little forest called Lapoigna next to a, a high-quality garlic-growing farming community of about 12 houses. And those people thought that that last remnant rainforest was safe forever stuff full of rare and endangered creatures, including Astrocopsis gouldi, the world's biggest freshwater crayfish, grows to a metre long and six kilograms in weight. Yeah. Tasmanian devils, quolls, white goshawks. Uh, but, and they didn't want environmental groups getting involved because it was so obvious they had a case that no government would log their forest to send it off to Ta An, the Malaysian log, corrupt Malaysian logging joint from Sarawak, which got $22 million given to it by a Labor government to come and set up uh, in Tasmania. Wrong. The bulldozers arrived, and when mm. they did to start logging this forest, the local farmers were the first line of defence. However, the state government had been elected, partly people had voted in majority for new laws to curb protest for the environment only. So that if you protest in front of an ancient tree in Tasmania, which is full of rare species these days, if you get in the way of a chainsaw, you face immediately $10,000 fine, and if you do it again, four years in jail. And a young woman called Jessica Hoyt, who had grown up in that forest and ridden her horse down the bridal trail and so on, she's now a neurosurgery nurse, uh, was one of the first to, the government said, it's not for mums and dads, these laws, it's against those radical extreme environmentalists. The first person arrested was a granddad, and the second person was her, young mum with two children. Well, uh, and I went along with Paul the next day, and we got uh, arraigned as well and, and taken off. They, they've dropped the charges now because Jessica and I took action and are taking action in the High Court to assert our rights under the Constitution for political expression, which includes Good. the right to peaceful protest that these politicians yeah. and corporations are trying to take away. <laughs> but, but watch. They're, now they're how long is that going to take? Before that's resolved, before that's oh, Well, that, that hearing is on, I think, on the 6th of September, the first of that uh, High Court hearing. I think they thought when they dropped the charges, we would drop the challenge in the High Court. Yeah. They, they didn't get yeah. that we're not in there for the, the reasons the they are. But um, the High Court case will proceed. But as you know, in New South Wales, what have they done? It's now a $5,000 pr uh, charge if you go out to Bentley next time around. And meantime, they've reduced the charge for criminal behaviour by mining corporations from a million dollars back to $5,000. That's the bad government. Western Australia the same. The corporations can see that civil is insurrection to protect the environment is coming. So they've moved in on spineless politicians to bring in draconian laws to ban protesting on the basis of protecting the planet's environment. And we citizens are going to have a choice whether we... Th that means we're stuck at home in our armchair, wringing our hands and feeling depressed, or whether we get out active and defiant and say, no, this planet is for us 
our fellow creatures and for our grandchildren and take us away, if you will. We're not going to be coerced like that. Okay. <laughs> how, how do you follow up on that? Um, well, I guess, you know, the question is, how is that kind of mobilisation going to happen? Is it going to be around, you know, spe you know specific uh, acts of vandalism, like Mike Baird cutting down, you know, all the trees on Anzac Parade, you know, to make way, way for a light rail, trees that were there to, you know, honour veterans of World War I. Unbelievable that the veterans' associations let him get away with that, but that's the kind of thing that's happening in the heart of Sydney. What, mm -hmm. What's happening with West Connects? I mean, these things are happening with seeming impunity. People go out and protest, they tie themselves to trees, they do everything, they get arrested, the development or the destruction goes on. So, I mean, it, what kind of tipping point do we need for, for that? For, for well, it all goes back to the vote. Uh, we are in a democracy. And, and, we're, we are and we're voting the wrong way. Yes. And we, and, and, so, and, what do we and do? And if you, if you vote for coal mines, because it's other issues of tax and, and um, funding of this or that, that's the priority, well, uh, we get coal mines and we get a destroyed environment and, and we, our, child, uh, uh, our grandchildren are shortchanged. So it is, because if we don't do it through democracy, we fight. And that's not an alternative on this mm. planet um, in, in this uh, century, And So, but uh, here's an example. If the, you can't cover everything. We, are, we can't do it. Many people are very, very busy. They're raising their families. We've got, we've got things to get on with. We can fund those people who are prepared not to just talk about it, but to be active. That's very, very important. And I can tell you that if the Adani coal mine goes ahead, I'm going to get a busload of people from Hobart, and most of them will be white or grey-haired like us, because we've got the time, we've got the money, and, and we're not tied down as much as younger people these days. And we're coming up to, through here to Adani, to sit in the way. And, and let's hope some other people get buses and do the same. When, when are you doing that? Uh, well, uh, I, yes. I think, the, I think people here would like to know. The Adani coal mine might not go ahead for economic reasons. Isn't that mm. incredible? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the minister for the ministers for the environment have ticked off on ecological reasons. You can blast the biosphere with massive tonnages of greenhouse gases out of the country. That's already the fifth worst, worst uh, polluter. But um, it, it, it's uh, the Indian ministers are saying they're not going to import coal three years from now because they're over there. They've got apparently more sense of what's going on than our ministers have here in Australia. However, we've got a new government in which the National Party people are saying, well, we want to fund the railway for Adani, and then we'll fund this. We'll do anything. We'll take people's money and do anything to get that coal mine going. So it looks like it's not going to make it economically unless this government goes so far out there using public funds to make it viable. That's where we need to hear it from the Australian people. Uh, in no uncertain terms. And all of us need to write to our politicians and say, if you spend one cent of my money on this coal mine, I will never vote for you again. That's, that's a, oh, by the way, write it on a nice card in handwriting mm. with a one dollar stamp on it and send it through the mail because it'll end up in their inbox. If you send an email, it's very likely just going to get a computer mm. answer. Mm. These things, and, and then asked to go and see them. These things matter. And we're all, we're in a democracy, we simply are sort of stunned into not using it in the way the corporations do. So we need a people's rejoinder. Well, I think on that note, we might go to the people and uh, uh, ask for questions from the audience. Um, please, as I said before, make them brief. And there's, there's a question, is there a mic? Mic? Okay. Now, well, while while we're waiting for the mic, David, you you had a point you wanted oh, no, to make. No, no, that's right. We've got a question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I thought we were a bit. Oh, I've got a mic. Someone's got a mic. 
Okay, but then the lady here should be should be next. Okay. Um, I grew up, um, unfortunately, in Question, Tony please. Abbott's um, constituent, and a lot of people in that area um, are quite self-motivated when voting. How do we use that in our advantage to get people to care about the environment? Did you hear the question? Um, how do we use the vote, get people or to vote for the environment? How do we use um, people who are motivated um, by their own self-interest um, and their own, you know, economic self-interest to care about the environment so that they vote in a way um, that will protect the environment? So how do you persuade people? Yeah, how do you persuade mm. people? Well, first, join any political party you like and, and reform it from within and pursue the... Uh, the environment. But uh, when it comes to elections, you simply have to say to people, if we don't vote for the environment, we're cheating our grandchildren. And if you go... And, and uh, this involves people being... Uh, mo writing to the newspapers, uh, blogging... You know, just being activated on the environment is of itself crucially important. When it comes to how do we change it... Well, I've been a senator in the Australian Parliament. I did something uh, short of... Um, what's required because I was never minister for anything and one of the things you're not, not supposed to do is speak up and say what you think at any given time. It's a great privilege. We have a representative democracy and becoming involved in politics either by the lobbying system to counterweight the vested interests or being involved within the, the uh, political organisations themselves is crucially important. And being out there and, and asking people in the run to an election, are you voting for the environment? And if not, why aren't your grandchildren important? I think it's a pretty potent question. Yeah. I, I, think, I think also yeah, it's getting, getting the right question out there because I think what we saw happening when, when there was proposals to, to frack, do fracking in some good agricultural land and so forth, we even got people who would normally be on the extreme right on side with stopping this. And so if the self-interest can also, if we can talk the self-interest in a way that also appeals to the values yeah. and economic needs of those individuals. For instance, in, with the Adani coal mine, we're basically setting the coal mine against the tourism industry. Mm. Because we're losing, mm. firstly, no one wants to visit Australia <coughs> to look at a coal mine or a fracking field. And <coughs> open cut coal mines are absolutely disgusting. And, and fracking fields are hardly attractive. They want to see the Barrier Reef. So, so if we can actually get people to switch their, their perception of their own self-interest. David, did you want to add to that? I would only, I'd only add a, really a, just reinforcing a point I made before, and that um, it, by, by introducing individual human rights into it, uh, that is actually one way, because we cannot enjoy the environment. And that's where I think the, the argument is useful, uh, is actually just as much in addressing the self-interest that can come into it, uh, that uh, there are plenty of human rights that cannot be properly exercised if, uh, if the environment is destroyed. They just cannot be. And if we need to make that argument as part of appealing to self-interested people, well, uh, it's a certainly a pragmatic and potentially very powerful way of doing it. The other issue is, of course, the right to a decent environment would indeed encompass precisely what Peter is saying there, because it's not just about how it affects you but how it affects the community, uh, the environmental degradation, as a right. If the Chair's allowed to join in the answers, um, I would like to um, endorse what Bob just said, and that is about joining a political party that you don't agree with. And I think that um, anyone who felt like joining should, should be joining the Liberal Party or the National Party right now. And the only way to change those parties is from, when, from within, I really believe that. Anyway, that question, yes. Is it working? <laughs> Is there a button on it or something? At the beginning of this session, there was a passing reference to the huge increases in population that are occurring. I was wondering why there is no more um, investment cooperation between the environmental movement and the smaller movements which assist women, particularly in the developing countries from where those population increases are coming, to control their own fertility. Well, 
We'd hoped as medical scientists, particularly in my area, which is infectious disease, that by uh, improving basic human health, particularly in developing countries, we would encourage people to have less, have smaller families. And that has happened in some areas, but not in others. So it's a bit discouraging in that sense. But the idea, in, for instance, in the developing world, where you're, you have no superannuation, you're dependent on your children surviving to, to look after you in old age and so forth. If you don't know your children are going to survive, you will have more children. But it's, it's a very slow train to turn. And the other thing is, of course, that, that uh, as Hillary Clinton uh, pushed, we, we must have uh, true equity in, in women's health globally. That the most important thing, actually, in the developing world is to promote women's health because that, again, gives access to contraception and, and, and so forth. And that's often denied in some societies. So, so at, at the heart of that question, we can't tell people not to have children. Uh, the, the environmental movement is actu and, the, and, the, and the climate change people are actually attacked uh, for, for on the basis of their promoting genocide in the developing world by try trying to, to argue we can't have infinite numbers of children. But what we can do in the positive sense is to try and improve global human health, particularly women's health. And I think that's, that has to be a major priority. Did you want to say anything on that, Bob? I was just to say that it's estimated that population will increase 30% this century and consumption will increase 300%. Uh, and, and one of the uh, best things we can do, of course, is just as Peter said, is uh, afford education and, and uh, a basic standard of living to poorer people because that's the biggest thing that's going to reduce pop population around the planet. Well, we're running a three-planet strategy with one planet. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. One of the things I found in, when I was involved with Greenpeace, as I was for about six years at the international level, that they were very reluctant to get involved in the population issue because they did not yes. want to get caught into the abortion debate, uh, particularly in countries like the United States. So, but I think it's a, Eve's question is a very good one about the, the need for the environmental movement to work more with uh, the women's movement and aid organisations that, that encourage uh, women to control their fertility. But it's, it's such a politically uh, fraught question in some cultures that it's... Uh, but I think it's an area we, we should be working to break down those barriers and to increase understanding about the health, economic and other benefits of smaller families, as, as Peter pointed out, and to do away with these kinds of well, suspicions. It's interesting. I mean, some countries were doing a, really a pretty good job of controlling population growth, and they're not countries you'd necessarily expect. They're countries like Iran. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? I think that One child. That's right, that's right. Oh, well, that's no, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you for coming. Yes, I've changed. There was a question back there. Put your hand up. Keep your hand up so the microphone can see you. Surely, in this world, if we accept the fact that all of these problems, such as global warming, come back to population control, and we're talking about governments controlling, I think the emphasis on controlling is uh, perhaps should be questioned. Why? Can you people tell me why is it that we cannot give free will to people and use the power of money to simply say, if you can prove you've had two children, it is your right to have a vasectomy and a tube tied for free? And that would solve the problem in a huge... Uh, and furthermore, you'd get um, people who didn't know how to bring children up or couldn't bring them up who'd already had two kids... Uh, that problem would disappear and the world would get itself together in a big hurry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Does, does anyone... Okay. We'll take that as a comment. Thank you. I, I, I think actually uh, some options almost like that have been tried in India. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Here's one, okay. Yeah. Can we get back to the children? I think converting... Speaking to the microphone. Speaking to a converted audience. Um, if you go back to the time of the Cold War, and the Russians discovered that children became very depressed about their prospects. And the same thing should now be happening to do with the environment, that if you get, don't you think, that if we get as many people involved as possible, not just in political parties, but with NGOs, environmental NGOs, there's a myriad of them out there on the internet, and get kids doing something 
it will stop them feeling as depressed as we all are getting and every little helps. Do you agree? Yeah, I think that's true. I, mind you, I'm not depressed and I'm, I'm getting happier and, and more uh, <laughs> defiant as time goes along. And I, I did have the privilege of speaking to 500 local school children here two days ago. What a bright-eyed lot of uh, get-up-and-go folk they are. And they, uh, they do need to be encouraged, but they need to be told that, um, you know, the old Bertrand Rus Russell dictum, um, the trouble with the world is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of self-doubt. <laughs> well, now I'm talking to 500 young intelligent people and you have to say, you will be full of self-doubt, you will tend to get depressed. I spent 10 years there when I was younger and, it's, and it doesn't get you too far. It's not a good feeling, and you, you know, but you have a right to be depressed in reacting to what's going on in the world. But the thing that changes that is when you take your right to see that we human beings using our intelligence could turn it around. We, and optimism drives that, and you're quite right. Getting involved is what uh, makes that go. And I said to a couple of young uh, women there, you know, set up your own group if you want to, just to uh, plant the vacant block or get the council to make it into a, uh, a protected area or to, or to in some way or other pr prove your local environment. Because organisation is very, very important. You need to learn organisation earlier and then you can become very uh, effective in a, in a bigger, wider world where we will organise to protect the environment or we'll lose it. So um, you're quite right. Uh, empowering kids is incredibly important. And as, let me apologise for those of you who've heard this before, but the Dalai Lama saying to that 14-year-old girl who asked him in Adelaide, what's the most important thing a young person can have? And I thought, oh, oh here comes compassion or hope or uh, <laughs> loveliness. <laughs> and he, he grabbed her by the hand and looked her in the eye and said, self-confidence. Yeah. And they have a right to self-confidence and we have to tell them that that's very, very important. You, each of us, is as important as anybody else, including Donald Trump. And we have to get, <laughs> get that into our own brains. Okay. And being talked out of being little people and disempowered and so on. Organisation will get us there. Okay. Um, P Peter wants to add to that, and there's a question well, over there. That'll be the last question. Just, just very briefly, like right. Bob, I've interacted with a lot of young people. They're, they're, they're extremely en energised by this issue, and the political landscape is going to change. I mean, if you look at the people who voted for ve Brexit, the people who vote for Trump, the people who voted in our current government, they're, they're over 50. If the vote was restricted to people under 50, we'd had totally different governance throughout <laughs> okay. the world. All right. Okay, last question. Sorry, Pete. Last question. This lady here with the hair. Well, I'm seeing this lady there. Sorry. If I miss somebody else, I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, no, hang on. Sorry. You don't have the call. This lady here does. Thank you. Um, it's been a wonderful talk, and thank you. There's so question, many things. Please. Come on, we've got to go okay. and let this guy have a go as well. So quick the, question. the question I have is... Um, at the United Nations level, people are looking for ecocide to be um, ratified as a criminal offence. And people have been acting for this since uh, genocide was actually made a, a law after Second World War, but that's been knocked so back what is your question? many times. I'd like to ask the panel, do you believe that uh, working at this level with the United Nations and um, making ecocide an international crime okay, okay, thank is going to be helpful and something that we all should be getting behind. Okay, thank you. Okay. And also the TPP. Thank you. We've got the, the TPP. Question. We've got the question. Thank you. Well, uh, we, David, we, David uh, answer that one. Sure. Sorry, I'm going to be ruthless. We've got about three minutes left. <laughs> I was just going to say that we do, we do our best with a global police uh, force to intervene where the United Nations votes on it and to uh, keep the peace or uphold effectively human rights. Uh, but as I said with the whaling earlier, the uh, one maverick country for profit breaches, thumbs its nose at a global tribunal finding that whaling's illegal and nothing happens. Now, um, here's something you won't expect a, a, a conservative greenie to say. We need a global environmental police force, just the same, which implements the law and upholds rulings of world courts on the environment. It's got to happen. It's no good having laws if you don't implement them and... and 
and ar arraign the culprits who are breaking it. David, do you want to say? Oh, look, I'd just add a very simple point. I'd love mm. to see uh, Global Environmental Police and uh, uh, all for it. But uh, I mean, I think one of the big one of the big issues with any uh, international criminal jurisdiction is buy-in from states because uh, there's a terrible history uh, in this field of uh, states not not accepting the jurisdiction um, of the court. And, uh, and not accepting enforceable judgments. I think the real thing, um, I mean, the law can only do so much. I think what we need uh, internationally uh, is a genuine commitment and, a, and, a, and I think amongst civil society globally, a massive moral shift in the way that we think. That I think is central to it. Okay, yeah, now final correct. question here, thank you. And does that lead on to Naomi Klein's uh, suggestion that we really need a global revolution? to take back power from uh, the multinationals and other organisations he feels cause this. Yes, well, uh, it does, except Naomi's saddled with being a North American. And uh, the problem there is that she doesn't understand that the political process has to be brought into play. It's no good having a civil... a Seattle uh, or a Wall Street sit-ins if there's no political follow-through. This uh, insurrection of people in defence of the environment has got to translate into political action. Now, that's why I was a Green. But if it's not going to be the Greens, it's got to be somebody else. And, and an insistence that we will not vote for people who are in favour of, of uh, more greenhouse gases, destruction of the species, or allowing the Japanese whalers to do what they like. So Naomi's right in that there is going to be... As we move closer towards cataclysmic climate, uh, uh, environmental breakdowns affecting all humanity, there's going to be greater and greater upwelling of, of uh, human concern about that. But it has to be translated into change, getting rid of the current growth-oriented governments and putting in green-oriented governments, to use a, a ge generic term, or we're headed for the alternative, and some of, uh, not Peter's colleagues, but some scientists predicting that instead of 12 billion people at the end of this century, there'll be one billion. That's unthinkable. But if we break down, if we don't use democratic, and I'm in favour of global democracy, if we, if we don't accept that the people of this earth have the wisdom to stop this process and bring it back into order, Chaos is the alternative. Well, on that, on that cheery note, um, I'm very <laughs> sorry we have to end it here, but I'm, I know Bob's a lot more optimistic than he intended to... Uh, yeah, I'm an optimist. He's an optimist, good. <laughs> uh, look, I want to thank this fantastic oh, panel, Peter Doherty, David Mann, Bob Brown. Thank you all very much. Thank you.